Okay, any questions that you have or comments, remarks about the Mino, especially, because that's the topic of this week. A more difficult reading, and you'll find Aristotle more difficult still uh, for next week. It'll be shorter. Uh, and then Anselm goes crazy, and then we'll come back from that abyss, and it'll be a little bit easier after that. Any questions about the Mino? What's going on in the Mino? Ethics, uh, it, uh, that, that's partially right. Um, and I understand exactly why that's the first thing that you would be inclined to say. But what is it? The word ethics isn't what they use. What do they talk about? Um, like, um, like what word would describe people? Um, what would describe people? Um, well, when, all right, well, what's the word that's used in, in, in in the dialogue. Do you remember? Virtue. Virtue, okay. Now, I understand exactly why you are paraphrasing in the way that you are, but it's risky. The first thing I want to do is to explain to you what the Greeks meant by virtue. Uh, I don't have to have a diagram here, but let's just put this up for <coughs> my use. Uh, go back. Um, most of us, in the normal English usage of the term, think of virtue as being specifically an ethical term, right? So I mean, it makes sense in our modern English usage to, uh, to think that we're talking about just ethics. But that's not the case for the Greeks. It's not the case for the Greeks. It's not just matters of ethics that are, being, uh, that are at stake here. Not necessarily of human beings either. The suggestion is, is it any quality of human beings? You mean any quality, or did you mean to narrow it down at least a little bit further? Like virtues as uh, uh, applying to, to human beings would be what kinds of features? OK, well, th we're guessing. I mean, I'm, I'm going to have to, uh, this is not something that I can expect you to know. I mean, this is not something that's in the book, and it's not something that's common knowledge. But uh, would you ever, in, in the English language, now this is just uh, a litmus here, uh, does it make any sense to you at all to talk about a virtuous computer or a virtuous monitor? Does that make any sense to you at all in English? Well, given the way that the Greeks used the term, that makes sense to the Greeks. <coughs> Now, we use value terms in we, some of our value terms in much the same way that they did. For example, I can talk about a good computer. That's a value term. And I can talk about a good monitor uh, and, a, and a good whiteboard and a good pen. I mean, these are ones that work properly. That's a value term. And there's good and bad pens, uh, things that uh, do or don't uh, suit their uh, purposes, do the things that they're supposed to do. Um, that's the way they use the term virtu virtuous or virtue. A virtue is any property at all uh, <coughs> that um, contributes. Looking for that word. To excellence in uh, things of a particular kind. I mean, that, that, that's kind of a qualification, things of a given kind. I mean, the virtues of a pen are not going to be the same things as the virtues of a TV. These are good making properties. Good. Good brief uh, summary of what I've got in mind here. Any property at all of a given kind of thing that, that uh, contributes to excellence in things of that kind, that's, that's a virtue. So when you list the virtues of, uh, 
of chairs, I mean, one of the most important ones would be that they support human weight. Uh, then there'll be different kinds of chairs, like uh, there's some debate about whether in classrooms you should have chairs that are more or less comfortable. If you have <laughs> chairs that are too comfortable, it's sometimes believed, uh, people will fall asleep more easily. You should have chairs that sort of not only support weight, but don't contribute to drowsiness. Uh, that's, those are the virtues of a classroom chair. But the virtues of an easy chair or of a reclinal lounger, they would be different. The virtues of a bar stool would be different still. It's still a kind of chair, I guess. Uh, so that different particular subclasses of things will have uh, differing virtues. But I think you've got the general idea. So when, uh, when the, the Greeks talk about virtue, they're not just talking about ethical issues. There aren't any real ethical issues to be raised about the virtues of a sewing machine. Uh, now, when they're specifically talking about people, they may not be talking about what we would think of as ethical issues either. What are the properties that make for excellence in a human being or in a human life? Well, some of them are going to be things like maybe honesty, uh, benevolence, kindness. Those are good making properties. Those are things that make people better people. But what you have to include here is anything at all that makes a human life better than it would be if it lacked that property. So, uh, yes? So you're saying they're not just talking about I mean, ethics? Or they're not just talking about ethics. But they, are, they could be talking about ethics. That's one of the things that they could be talking about, because ethical properties are among the properties that make for excellence in human beings. But here are some examples of, uh, of some other ones. Cleverness, knowledge. Those are not particularly ethical, but they're better properties to have than not to have. Wealth, power. Uh, the Greeks, like all of us, can argue about which are the things that make for a good human life and which things don't. But it's at least in the ballpark of the inquiry to suggest, as uh, Aristotle did, and as some Greeks would, that a certain degree of wealth is necessary for a good human life. Why? Well, consider this, for example. One of the properties that it's important to have is kindness and benevolence. Now, that's an, that's an ethical one. But in order for your kindness and benevolence to do any good, you ought to have some resources with which to be kind and benevolent. You do more good than you otherwise would if you got some resources to use. Power, well, we often think of power as corrupting. And Aristotle and other Greeks would have thought that, too. They would have think of power as having the potential of corrupting. But powerlessness is no good. To be completely impotent, without resources, and without the ability to accomplish your goals is not a particularly <clears throat> good thing in a human life. It's better to have some power tempered by wisdom and benevolence. So that's the way this all works. So it's just as you say, the, the things that are virtues in a human being includes the normal list of ethical virtues, but there's other virtues too. It's not just ethics. And I'm glad that you brought it up right, right away, because that's the first and most important thing to know about what they're talking about. And what are the questions that they're asking in there? They're talking about virtue, but what are the questions about virtue that are raised there? Yeah. Is it taught? Can virtue be taught? And just cutting to the to the uh, chase, what's the answer to that question that's given? Answer isn't yes. Virtue can't be taught. Instead, what? But it's knowledge of virtue. Knowledge isn't exactly. I mean, knowledge is among the things that one could uh, attribute or call human virtues, like I said a moment ago. But knowledge isn't virtue. I mean, they're not equivalent. I mean, not, you know, to, to know things, let's put it that way. To know some things is better than not to know things. To be wise is better than not to be wise. In the back. Um, it's a gift possessed from the gods. It's a gift from the gods. Now, you can take that in a couple of different ways. And, uh, one way would be 
Well, some people have it, and some people don't. The gods determine who gets it and who doesn't. That's kind of an elitist interpretation, and that might be correct. That might be what Plato has in mind. But there's another interpretation that seems to me to, to actually, I mean, he may have meant both of these things. There's no reason why they're not in conflict. But, but the other interpretation is a little bit more fruitful uh, in the general discussion. I think uh, he means at least also to say that uh, virtue isn't the sort of thing that other people can give you. I mean, that's what he means to em emphasize, that uh, your having it is not dependent on somebody else's giving it to you. Now, that's one of two main themes. And the one I want to spend more time on is the one about knowledge. Okay. Theme one, virtue. Theme two is knowledge. But before leaving the virtue area, um, let me. Uh, Before leaving the uh, discussion of virtue, I want to remind you about one of those pre-Socratics that I mentioned the other day, uh, the group called the Sophists, headed by Protagoras. Uh, there's some reason to think that uh, competition from this other group of philosophers uh, is, is what motivates a lot of, uh, <coughs> of Plato's own work. Um, th what do they believe? Do you remember what Protagoras is noted for believing? Man is the measure of all things. They were relativists, thoroughgoing relativists, not just about ethics, but about uh, our views of the world. And uh, what's more, the sophists had a reputation as itinerant teachers. They would go from city to city, uh, offering their skills. This is before there were anything like universities. Plato, in fact, uh, partly, I believe, to uh, counteract the influence of the sophists, established the first university, if you like, in Athens himself, called the Academy. Uh, but before that time, they didn't have set institutions. Teachers would go from town to town and sell their services to the wealthy families. And uh, if there were really a, uh, a general doctrine that these sophists taught, it seems to have been something like what Protagoras taught. Uh, they would uh, proclaim their ability to prepare the young men. It wasn't the women who would get an education. It was just the young men who could prepare the young men for their lives in whatever particular society they lived in. So if the teacher, one of, the, one of these sophists, were, was visiting Athens, then their uh, sales pitch would be this. They'd say, look, we can, you, know, you send your kid to me, <coughs> and uh, we'll teach this kid everything he needs to know to be successful in Athens, if that's what you have in mind for him. Uh, if, on the other hand, uh, you're, he's going to be your sales representative in Sparta or something like that, or if he's going to be a statesman, we'll have to teach him some of the things that you have to know in Sparta. But the main thing is, we'll teach him what's right and what's wrong in Athens, because after all, answers to these questions differ from place to place. But we'll teach your kid what it is that's regarded as right and wrong in Athens, and what's regarded as being successful or not successful in Athens. And then if they would wander down to Sparta, they would sell their product teaching uh, with a comparable line, this time all about Sparta. They would say, we're not going to bother your kid about uh, what you need to know in Athens if your kid isn't going to live in Athens. We'll teach you the principles of right and wrong as they are understood in Sparta. And we'll teach you the worldview that is most widely believed in Sparta. And if the parent says, well, you know, you know like I'd like my kid to know what's, what's the fact of the matter. I mean, I want to know him to know what really is right and wrong. And I want him to know uh, the way the world really is. Never mind what the Spartans believe, never mind what the Athenians believe. And that's where the sophists, or at least Protagoras, would proclaim, you know, well, there is no such thing as the facts of the matter. All there are are these different views that are, 
that, are, that vary from culture to culture. There's no such thing as objective truth in these areas. We'll teach your kid what your kid needs to know. Won't bother him with questions that have no answers, like questions about the objective truth. So we'll, we'll make a success of your kid. Now, this is not very far different from the, uh, at least part of the marketing strategy of modern universities. Modern universities also advertise to their prospective clients and, their, and the parents of their prospective clients that the main reason why you should send your kid to school X, like RIT, say, is because you know, we'll help them learn what they need to know to lead a good life. And we'll teach them what they need to know uh, not only about their careers, but about other stuff so that they can go, they're prepared to go out there and lead a good life. There's not the same uh, emphasis on relativism, but again, it's not, you know, sometimes it does seem, I think, in the modern educational world that the most important thing is how do I succeed? That's the most important question. That's what I want to get out of college. I mean, a lot of people have that attitude. I want to know, I want to know uh, what do I need to succeed? And uh, while it might be very interesting to pursue deeper questions about what's the truth and what's the meaning of life and things like that, uh, nonetheless, uh, I don't really have a lot of time for those questions right now. I need to get my, my career training under my belt. And that's, that's not just RIT that markets itself that way. That's just about every school on the planet these days. Um, but that's the way, uh, a more radical version of that is the way that the sophists mar marketed themselves. And so they taught that they could teach virtue, meaning those things, those excellences that uh, the young student would need in order to succeed in life. And uh, it's against that doctrine, I think, that, uh, that Plato is directing his attention here in Amino. He says, no, virtue can't be taught. It can't be given to you by something, somebody else. Uh, you either got it or you don't. And the place to look is inside for your virtue, for excellence. It's not something you can get from someplace else. Uh, I guess the same lesson might be taught about the modern self-help book industry. I mean, the self-help book industry is based on the idea that you should buy these books, and they'll help improve you. And I think Socrates' message would be, well, you know, it's not really likely that you're going to get, you know, you're not going to get excellence from these books. It's inside you. The very best that these books could do is to serve as a catalyst. I mean, they might inspire you to look inside at the right thing. They might direct your attention in the right way so you can find your excellences, but you're going to find it inside you. No one else can give it to you. And I think that's what he means by saying, I mean, that's at least one of the most important things he means by saying that virtue can't be taught is the gift of the gods. So much, at least for the moment, for virtue. Uh, what I want to spend most of our time talking about today and Wednesday is uh, this somewhat more interesting to me, anyway, doctrines that uh, Plato has about knowledge. They're interesting in part because there's some of them kind of weird. Uh, I hope you noticed that there was you know, the stuff about virtue in the beginning and f stuff about virtue at the end, but then a lot of other stuff in the middle that didn't seem to, you know, relate to virtue very much. And I think that's one of the things that confuses readers of the Mino for the first time. Also, there's a kind of sense in which you're left hanging at the end about virtue. Uh, it can't be taught, it's not clear what it is, and they just kind of wander off. That's the way a lot of Plato's dialogues end. They raise a question, and they talk about it for a while, and by the time they get finished, they haven't, they haven't settled the issue. <coughs> now that, at least, that part of these dialogues may be true to the real live Socrates. Because Socrates, after all, said he didn't have any doctrines. He didn't know anything. He just served to sort of be a critic of other people's views. He thought that was extraordinarily useful service. But that would mean that his conversations wouldn't end up with answers to the original questions. Indeed, people would maybe go into these conversations thinking that they had answers uh, to the questions like, what is virtue? What is justice? What is piety? They may, people may think they had answers to the questions. The function of the dialogue and the function of Socrates' analysis, as often as not, is to just show people that those particular answers won't work. And 
you don't get an answer to the question at the end. In fact, you're sort of robbed of your sense that you knew what you were talking about in the first place. What is knowledge in this dialogue? There's a contrast, for example. I'm going to take another page so I can blow up this knowledge thing a little bit bigger. There's a contrast between knowledge and how does he put this? Uh, is it? I always I have so many different synonyms: true opinion or true belief. He distinguishes between these two now. You should know that when we're talking about knowledge, we're in an area of philosophy called epistemology. And here we're discussing Plato's <coughs> epistemology. Uh, ology, that suffix, what does that usually mean? Do you know? Whenever you see it? Study of. Study of okay. So this is the study of epistem. <laughs> it's the study of knowledge, okay? And the first question in epistemology, the, the deepest question is, is there anything that we really know? And to give a negative answer to that, to say, well, no, there's nothing we really know. All we have is beliefs and opinions. To say that there's nothing that we can really know is to take a position called skepticism. The skeptic says, the epistemological skeptic says, there is no real knowledge. Uh, but if you think there is some knowledge, then there's a whole bunch of further questions to ask. Like, well, what characterizes knowledge? How can we distinguish knowledge from mere belief, mere opinion? How do we get knowledge? Are there reliable ways of acquiring knowledge? There's a whole er sub-area of epistemology, at least I think of it this way, called philosophy of science. Uh, science seems to Many people, to be an ex most people, I think, be an extraordinary, an extraordinarily successful uh, way of gaining knowledge. Um, so you, you want to study knowledge, what is, or study science. What is it about science that makes it so successful? Is there such a thing as a scientific method? Uh, if not, then what is it that characterizes this huge array of disciplines that we call sciences? How do we tell sciences from non-sciences? Um, maybe there's some of them that, I mean, some people would claim that uh, some disciplines that use the word science in their name are just trying to uh, get the prestige that the real sciences have. And the real sciences are limited to things like physics and chemistry, <coughs> biology. Uh, so the, the people who think that are inclined to dismiss the claims of the social sciences to scientific status. But then there's all kinds of good arguments that suggest that the hard sciences themselves are but doctrines held by a certain part of society. So that they may best be investigated by the social sciences themselves. Uh, lots of controversy here, but the whole question is, is it, not, is it true or is it not that the sciences have something especially good going for them when they're in, in, the, in the quest of knowledge? And if so, if they do have something especially good going for them, what is it? Because if you could figure that out, then maybe you'd be able to take that thing that sciences do so well and bring it over to some other area of inquiry and use it there and get the same kind of success. That's part of the motives. All right, but epistemology is generally the theory of knowledge. And what we're trying to do here is to figure out uh, what's, how, what's the distinguishing character of knowledge, what makes it different from true opinion. Now, I'm going to ask you that question. I want you to think about it, given what you've read. What is it that Plato says distinguishes knowledge from true opinion? <coughs> Remembering that it's true opinion that we're talking about here, true belief. It can't be. The answer is not going to be that knowledge is truer than true opinion. Nothing is truer than true opinion. True opinion is true. If I have a true belief, it's a true belief. It's true. So that's not the thing that distinguishes between knowledge and, and, and true opinion. There are also false opinions I have. But we're not talking about those right now. 
So among the beliefs that you have that are true, what's the distinguishing characteristic? According to Plato, or if you don't like that question, according to you, if you think there's a difference, what's, what distinguishes between these two? I knew the Mino was tougher than the other ones. There's far fewer hands this time. Yeah? Maybe the differently, like some people might not think a true thing is true, so they're not as true. Okay, so some people might not think that the true opinion is true, whether or not it's true. Isn't that also true of knowledge? I mean, if you're thinking about, if you're thinking about a particular proposition, like well, we've used as an example before the Pythagorean theorem. So I'll put that up here in its algebraic form. Some people might not think that's true. Other people might think it's true, but not be sure. And yet other people, well, might know it to be true. And that's what we're trying to find out the, what, what distinguishes all these things. Um, let's get another candidate. Yeah. So the suggestion is that no, uh, opinion is something you acquire by yourself, whereas knowledge is something that's either learned from someone else or acquired through experimentation. Don't you acquire beliefs sometimes, even false ones, let alone true ones? Don't you sometimes acquire false beliefs from other people? And can't you also acquire false beliefs from experiments? So what's the distinguishing <laughs> feature of knowledge? You had your hand up. Um, is it that opinion can be taught but knowledge is something you just have? You just have. Opinions can be taught, but knowledge is something you just have. Yeah, like, um, There's some truth in that as far as Plato is concerned, although I don't think that at this stage of the discussion that makes a great deal of sense. We're trying to work up to there. Plato really does think that knowledge, like virtue in a way, is something that you just either have or don't have. Um, that's not its key feature, though. Uh, a true opinion or true belief can never be discredited, whereas knowledge could be refuted. Knowledge can be refuted. It's, the, it's precisely the opposite. Okay. Uh, the suggestion was uh, true opinion can't be discredited, right. while knowledge can. I like the idea, though. Consider this. I mean, I think, see if this is I'm following your. Uh, if I have, I mean, some beliefs that I have may not be susceptible to any kind of tests at all. I mean, they're just beliefs I have, and I'll hold on to them come hell or high water. I mean, it doesn't matter what happens. And, uh, and so, I mean, there's nothing that two, two people who have different beliefs, there's nothing they can do about it. I mean, they just, you know, maybe they can persuade one another, but there's just no evidence that could ever bring the. I don't know. I don't think opinion is necessarily the word to describe that, but it's an interesting distinction. Whereas, and you're suggesting knowledge is something that is refutable. It's something that, at least in principle, there could be some evidence that uh, would, you know, you could bring it to the court of evidence. I guess that's the very interesting proposition, but it's not Plato's distinction. Certainly not Plato's distinction. And I don't think, if you think about that for a while, there's lots of things that you can bring to the court of uh, experiment that you wouldn't want to call knowledge. Plato says it's this. How am I going to put this so it's just right? I'm going to have to spell it out a little bit uh, to make this just the way I want it. If I truly know something, then I must be able to prove it. And by prove it, I'll put more underlines. Plato doesn't mean just give some good reason for. He means prove beyond all doubt. 
to be able to, 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 be, to truly know something. There can be not one shadow of a doubt for Plato. that you have the opinion? Right. Probably not. We'll see in a moment what standards we're applying here. But uh, you know, proving that you have an opinion, in any case, is different than proving that opinion. Um, here's an example right off the top of my head. As far as Plato's concerned, now I'm sure I'm sure that the Pythagorean theorem is true. I'm absolutely positive of that. That doesn't yet entitle me to say I know it. Why? Well, because I can't prove that right now. I cannot right now give you the proof. I'd have to be able right now, before you, to prove, to, sh to, to line by line, show you the proof of the Pythagorean theorem one way or the other, either in its geometric form or in its algebraic form, that's the way you're looking at it here, I have to be able to prove it. What does that mean? I'd have to be able to start from, this is, this is the real, real proof, indubitable premises. Start from things that can't be false. Things like, uh, <coughs> come back to that, here's another word. Tautologies, things, sentences, really, or propositions that must be true for logical reasons. Such as. All red wagons are red. Or perhaps more inter interestingly, another kind of example. All bachelors are unmarried. That's true by definition. So ideally, in a, in a real proof, you want to start off you want to be able to start off from things that have to be true, things like tautologies, logical truths, take combinations of them, perhaps, and from those derive, through perfectly rigorous logic, any theorems or conclusions. And those theorems and conclusions, if you've done all of that, those theorems and conclusions, you can say you know. Now, I can't do that. Going back here. I can't do that with the Pythagorean theorem. So I don't know it. I believe it. <coughs> now, it can be proven. I'd love to say it can. All right, let's, on the presumption that it can be proven using those extremely rigorous standards that I just outlined a second ago, then it's something that can be known. And if I, I mean, I, once upon a time, I did know it. I did know it once upon a time, because once upon a time I could prove it from at least what seemed like. Let's just <coughs> put some of the stuff aside. But uh, what seemed like logically necessary uh, assumptions. But I can't do that anymore, so I don't know it anymore. Now, why isn't it knowledge anymore? Well, it's because it's, under, it's, it's lost its reliability. If I can't now prove it, I'm relying either on memory or I'm relying on something somebody else told me, or I'm relying on a book. And all of these things, obviously, can be mistaken. I might be relying upon popular consensus. Everybody believes that c squared equals a squared plus b squared by now, so I believe it for, you know, just because everybody else does. But if I can't right now prove it, then I'm, I'm, I'm relying on a source that's not perfectly reliable. To say I know something, I have to be able to prove it. Now, is, the, is it clear what he's getting at? 
He wants to distinguish knowledge from true opinion. I do have, since this is provable, I mean, since it can be proved, uh, my, my opinion that it's true is correct. It's a true opinion. That's not knowledge. We're going to get to that's that's a very tricky and intriguing part of the dialogue. It's the most intriguing part of the dialogue. What did you make? What did you think? I mean, you may not have been sure, but what did you think was the upshot of that little part of the dialogue? What was the conclusion that we're the conclusion that we're to draw from that part, from that little discussion with the with the slave boy? They're trying to get to uh, figure out what. He seems to come to know something. Socrates claims he's not really teaching. I mean, he's not giving the knowledge to the slave boy. <coughs> Instead, there's some sense in which the slave boy already knew it. Uh, given this definition of the word knowledge, such that if I truly know something, then I must be able to prove it. As we will see, Socrates is arguing that anything I really know, I've known all, all along. I just didn't remember it. That anything that can be, that I, I am in a position of truly knowing isn't something that can be given to me. It's something that I've known all along, in particular since prior to birth. That's the peculiar doctrine that I, <laughs> that I keep hinting at and pointing at. That's w one of the most peculiar doctrines in there. But we'll get to that. Yeah. Well, the question was on what Socrates knew or knowledge. Yeah, the question is, what is the distinguishing feature? I've given that. What were you going to say, though? Okay, could you summarize that? Because I didn't hear it. It was going so fast and it started quiet. So if you. Okay. Um, it says in the book, he said um, during the time that the slave exists um, and is not a human being, um, he will have true opinions. Okay, I'm confused about how he is existing and is not a human being. Can you tell me the page that we're on? Um, page 17. And where are you on the page? Um, Those little letters and numbers on the sides by the way, are in fact references to page numbers. They're, uh, they're references to page numbers in a sort of a standard edition of Plato's works. But uh, you can say 86C, and for example, and that gets you right to not only this edition, but to any other book that, that includes these references. And so you can compare different texts. But where are you? The one above me. OK. OK, no. Ah. They're talking to prior to his birth, right? There is the, it's, he has not acquired these beliefs in his present life. It must be clear that he had them and learned them at some other time. Uh, and that was the time when he was not a human being. So that's prior. So there's an existence that the slave boy, and presumably we all have, uh, prior to our physical birth uh, as a soul. Now, that's another powerful thesis, peculiar thesis. Based on this theory of knowledge, Plato thinks he has an argument to suggest that the soul existed before this life. Now, that same argument won't work about an afterlife. He, has, he offers another argument later on for that, not in the Nino. But this argument offers not religious, but epistemological reasons. That is, reasons based on the nature of knowledge. 
for saying that the soul has to exist before this life. And it's those, those two theses, one, one that anything that we can know can't be learned in this life, it has to have somehow been there all along, and therefore there must be an earlier life. Those, those are the two theses I want to investigate. Here's a model proof. Yeah? Is there really knowledge, though? Because it's slave in there. Oh, that's what exactly he thinks. Yeah, he thinks that that's exactly what he has elicited in the slave, but not because he's given him anything, but uh, he's shown the slave uh, that he knows something that the slave didn't realize he knew before. Socrates says of himself uh, and says of all real uh, elicitations of knowledge in people that, uh, that the, what we call the teacher is not someone who, I mean, when the teacher is successful, it's not because the teacher gives anything to the student. It's because the teacher su uh, successfully elicits knowledge from the student. Uh, Plato thinks of himself as acting as a midwife. <laughs> Socrates does. Socrates uh, thinks of himself as acting as a midwife to the birth of knowledge. He's not responsible for the knowledge's being there. Uh, he just helps it come out. But yes, indeed, what he thinks is that that, uh, that particular little uh, episode with the slave boy is something that will stick. And that's, by the way, the advantage of knowledge over true opinion. The advantage of knowledge over true opinion, one important one, is that it sticks. We'll get back to that uh, <coughs> later. But it, uh, I think what, uh, what the words that are used in the text, uh, Plato has Socrates say that knowledge runs away. In true opinion, it runs away, it escapes. If all we have is true opinion, it escapes. I'll give you an example of this. Let's say I gave you, I gave you this problem. I said, uh, let's say I told you, all right, I want you all to take careful notes because this is going to be on your test on Friday, this problem. And I'm going to show you the solution. I want you to take careful notes, because this problem will appear on your test just like that, and you're going to have to know the answer. And I'm going to give you the answer right now. So there it is. There's the answer. Write it down, because it's going to be on your test. Come on, write it down. It's going to be. Your, your, your normal reaction is quite reasonable, namely, uh, I don't need to write that down. Give me the damn problem. <laughs> I see it. I'll do it then, right? I don't need to write the answer down. Unlike many other things. Now, what's the, what's the I mean, consider the, 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 the poor fellow who, has, who doesn't understand arithmetic, doesn't know arithmetic, and they're sitting there carefully taking notes. And then imagine that poor person's plight come Friday when the test rolls around. Uh, you know, they got it maybe written on their wrist or under their watch band or something, or maybe they're just reciting as they walk to class. See, 3,486,984,082 plus 908,700,943 equals 4. Maybe just, maybe all he has to do is recite this. They'll, they'll, okay, 4,475,657,025. 4 billion, you know, just over and over, memorizing the thing. And then finally, when gets to the test, sits down, looks at the thing, thumbs through the test to find that problem and gets it down as fast as he can before he forgets. And they go, Phew, and he gets it right. That's a good example of true opinion. I mean, he has the opinion that this is the answer to this question, and that opinion is true. It's correct. This is the answer. He doesn't get the problem wrong. He gets that, he gets, he gets that question right. But he doesn't really know it. That's the point. He, uh, for, for Plato, he doesn't have any kind of understanding at all why this has to be true. So another way of putting this definition, I put semicolon, I must know why it has to be true. Now that has as a consequence that the only things that are knowable are things that have to be true. That restricts it pretty narrowly. We can't know things like the capital of New York. That's not something that can be known, because it's not provable in this rigorous sense. 
you'll remember the the um, the conflict that I described <coughs> back in the first week of the quarter between the the the, the sophists and Protagoras as uh, as the most famous of the sophists. Uh, their relativistic doctrines that said that man is the measure of all things conflicted with a doctrine central to the teachings of the Pythagoreans. The Pythagoreans seemed to think that there were some areas in which man was not the measure of all things, namely in mathematics, in geometry in particular. That there were true answers to mathematical questions. Here was an area where you could know something. And what was the characteristic feature of that area? It was an area wherein things could be proven. What we see from the Mino, uh, uh, we've gotten far enough to see this, is that Plato takes the side of the Pythagoreans in that debate. And Plato, in defining knowledge in terms of provability, is suggesting that, uh, that what we really should do is focus our attention. If we want knowledge, focus our, we should focus our attention on the things that can be proven. Uh, I mentioned also, I believe, last time that Plato was the uh, founder of the first university, at least in Europe. It was called the Academy. And over the doors of the Academy, there was a slogan that had this effect. I'm not sure the exact wording, but it's something like, uh, if you don't know geometry, don't bother to come, on, come in. The reason being that uh, geometry was the model and it had, wasn't yet axiomatized. Euclid is not yet on the scene. All we have are, are results like those of the Pythagoreans, proofs of particular theorems like the Pythagorean theorem. We have that uh, at, when we're at the time that Plato founds the academy, we have lots and lots of different proofs of theorems based on uh, arguments that seem to go back to obvious presumptions, obvious premises. That's what we should be looking for in every area of inquiry, where you can't get that kind of provability. Well, then you're not going to be able to get knowledge. His attitude is kind of like uh, the attitude of many non-philosophy students uh, in the modern world, uh, namely, well, all these uh, philosophical issues where there's lots of different opinions. I mean, there's, those are all very nice, and, and, I, and I guess they're kind of interesting, but I don't really have a lot of time for that. I need. I want to explore an area where I can get some good, solid basis for the things that I'm being taught. I mean, give me facts. It's an attitude that's uh, that's a pretty widespread modern attitude. Um, you know, maybe maybe later in my my life I'll have time to to sort of think over some of these more controversial areas like politics and ethics. Those are all very interesting. But what I need right now are facts. Give me good hard facts. And Plato's attitude, uh, founder of modern philosophy and science in a way uh, that he was, uh, his attitude uh, was along those same lines. I mean, the things that are to be discussed here in my university are things that are provable. Uh, the world of opinion, we leave outside the walls. The discussion of things that are mere opinions, we leave outside the walls. Yeah? Would uh, Plato agree with Socrates that you don't learn, but you only recollect because you're so old? I would say that it's fairest to say that this is Plato's doctrine. Remember, Socrates uh, claims not to have any doctrines, not to have any theories. And uh, while I don't know whether he stuck to that all of his life, I think we're beginning to see in the Mino, uh, we're seeing some of the stuff that Plato is putting forward and having Socrates uh, be his voice in the dialogue. So this is a Plato's doctrine. There's no. And I think any time you're asking questions about this, Plato agree with Socrates about this, very dodgy questions. We don't have any independent record of much of that Socrates thought independently of Plato. So it's hard to make a comparison like that. OK, so I want to show you some things about proofs that will help us understand the odd doctrine about knowledge that Plato has. Our, our objective today is to figure out, that our main objective is to figure out why Plato thinks that anything you know uh, you must have known all your life. You have to have gotten somehow before birth. Here's a simple uh, logical proof, if you like. It starts off, I mean, every proof has to start off somewhere with what they call premises or assumptions, uh, axioms. When you come to you know, fancy theories like geometry, then the assumptions or premises from which everything else gets derived, they're called axioms. If you take the whole set, 
In, in the case of Euclidean geometry, there were five axioms from which all the rest of the, of the theorems of geometry could be derived if you, you know, include a few definitions here and there and rules of inference. But here's a simple proof that meets the kinds of standards that Plato has for all knowledge. Back up. Those are the assumptions we begin with. And I think uh, you could all, in unison even, tell me what may be proven from these two assumptions. What can I, I draw the line it's usually, this, this convention is to, that that's kind of a therefore line. Assumptions are above the line, and uh, so what can I prove here? Yeah. And you could plug in anything you like in the A spots, as long as you plug the same thing in both A spots. You can plug in anything you like in the B spots, as long as it's the same thing, as long as you're consistent. And the same with the C. You can just pick anything you want, and it will come out that if, and this is what the, what's true about logic, if the premises are true, then the conclusion has to be true, has to be true. And it's one of the things I want to explore at first is, what's the sense of has to be? I mean, nothing's necessary, you might think. Nothing's, you know, nothing has to be true. Well. Again, if the premises of a, of, a, of a logical argument are true, the conclusion has to be. And just to show you the sort of thing that I have in mind, this is a valid, a valid argument form. Uh, let's just make some substitutions. Let's, uh, for example, say, Proposition one, all, give me a word that starts with A, a noun. I didn't hear it. <coughs> Apples. Give me any word that hits, uh, 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 that starts with B right off the top of your head. Blue. OK. And then all, I have to put blue things so that I can make these all substantives, all nouns. All blue things are what? C. Quick. Cars. Cars. Good. Therefore, that's two. This is three. Therefore, all apples are cars. Now, it's hard to have intuitions about this sort of stuff, but I'm going to claim to you that if one and two were true, even though they're not, <laughs> but if even if they, not even, if they were true, then three has to be true. Has to be true. Come back to that in a second. Well, let's see, I may, I may need this, let's put this side by side. Because what I want to show you is another way of displaying logical arguments. It's called Venn diagrams. And we're going to make a Venn diagram of this argument. Uh, first, a couple of, uh, let me come back up a little bit. Oh, that's not starting to go. Um, Venn diagrams make use of uh, circles. Uh, uh, who's familiar with them? A few people. OK. So that we represent sets of things, categories of things, kinds of things, all of, all of those are just different ways of saying the same thing, the circle. So there's the circle, call it A, that represents, I'm going to say, all the apples that there are, all the apples that ever have been or ever will be. This is the set of all apples. Anything inside the set is an apple. Anything outside the set is a non-apple. So this is outside here, the whole rest of the world. <laughs> Not just the paper, but these are non-A, non-apples. So penguins are out here. Uh, all apples are in there. If I wanted to talk about a particular apple, I might, I mean, I'm not going to make use of this too much, uh, might use a little x inside the set of apples to indicate a particular apple, or a little x outside 
the circle to indicate a particular non-apple, like a mailbox. Okay. But I won't worry about that right now. If I wanted to say, uh, that, now we're going to get to one and two in a second, but let's say I wanted to say that no apples are blue things, I would construct two circles. I would construct an A circle and a B circle. How would I draw, anybody, how would I draw no apples are blue things? Yes? Two separate circles. Two separate circles. A. B, no apples are blue things. How about some apples are blue things? Somebody else. How would I represent that? They overlap a little bit. Overlap a little bit, exactly. And the ones that I'm thinking about, if I say some apples are blue things, those things are the ones in there in the little overlappy area. Okay, Those are the apples that are also blue. Now that those just were two exercises. How will I represent number one? All apples are blue things. Some third person who hasn't spoken yet sort of pass this around. All apples are blue things. Yes? Uh, it's a little more complicated than that. Yep. Okay, right. The A circle must appear inside the B circle in order to not say more than what you want. It might be that all blue things are all also apples, in which case then the circles would coincide. But all you want to say is all apples are blue things. So here's, here's proposition number one. And this indicates, because this is all <coughs> we've said, this indicates that all apples are blue things and seems to indicate also that there are some blue things that aren't apples, like shirts. There's some blue shirts. This says all apples are blue things. How well am I going to do number two? <coughs> Yet some other person. <coughs> yeah. Where, where, where does the C circle go? Okay, all blue things are cars, or all B is C, just like that. Correct. Does everyone see that this is right? Does anyone have any questions about this? So what I've done is I've, I've in the same drawing, this one, I have uh, indicated both the information that's in one and the information that's in two, correct? Any questions? Here, yes? Yeah. Can the A actually be an X? I mean, the second one it doesn't mention A. Doesn't I can't it? hear you. In the well, it, the, the second one doesn't mention A, but the first one does. And I'm trying to combine the information in the two propositions. And if I know that all apples are blue things, and if I also know that all blue things are cars, this is what I know. Right? If I include both of those pieces of information. That's what I'm trying to do. In the combination of one and two, what I want you to notice now is that the three is already up there. The conclusion is already there. That's the, way, the sense in which if both one and two were both true, three has to be true. One way of saying that is it's, it's because the information in three is already contained in the combination of one and two. Now, this is a simple and uh, perhaps you know, overly obvious argument to use as an example. But it, it's, I wanted to use it because uh, I think it's clear. When you get combinations of five propositions, like you have in, in geometry, from which you're trying to derive conclusions, you can get some pretty novel conclusions, pretty surprising things. There's nothing surprising about all A is C <laughs> being derived from these, for these two. But, uh, but when you, you know, when you get more complicated propositions and when there are more of them, you can get some pretty surprising results. Like you can get that the, the square on the hypotenuse of any right triangle is always equal to the sum of the squares on the other two sides. And you can get another big surprise 
the internal angles of any three tri uh, uh, of any triangle at all, the three interior angles of any triangle at all, always will equal 180 degrees when you add them up. That's a surprise, but you can prove that. You can demonstrate it. And what you're doing when you prove something in this strong sense of proof, this mathematical, logical sense of proof, what you're really doing is you're just unpacking information that you already have. You may not see it. It may not be transparent. It may not be obvious. But all you're doing is unpacking information that's already in your presumptions. Correct? Now, that's key to understanding Plato's epistemological argument in the Meno. First, there's his definition of knowledge. You don't really know anything unless you can prove it with a big P, prove. He means proof, like in math, pure math, like in logic, pure logic. Not just provide reasons for. Unless you can logically demonstrate something, you don't really know it. Because that means that there always would be some room for it to be false. And if there's some room for something to be false, then according to Plato, you don't really know it. So that's the first thing. To know something, you have to be able to prove it. And the second thing is, to prove when, you, when we prove things, all we're really doing is unpacking information from things that we already knew. Now, I've offered you this as a, a representative of a valid argument form. There's lots of valid argument forms. To talk about that more, you'd have to take a course in logic. Uh, but you can see from this example, especially when we used these substitution values, that <coughs> validity, being valid, is not all we want out of our arguments. Because uh, this doesn't prove to us that all apples are cars. Indeed, we know that all apples aren't cars. In fact, no apple is a car. Maybe there's something like the Oscar Mayer Wiener, Wiener Mobile. Maybe some car, uh, apple mobile is driving out there. So maybe some apple-like things are cars. But you know, this is, this is wacko. We haven't proven anything. All we've got is validity. So the other thing you need in your argument, actually, the, 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 the name for uh, the arguments we want is we want sound arguments. I'll put that in quotes. <laughs> are, and they are, one, valid. That's the first condition for an argument if it's going to be a sound argument. But two, the assumptions are true. So what you really want out of an argument is for it to be sound. That is, not just valid, but also you want a valid argument whose, whose assumptions, premises are true. And then you can have confidence in the conclusion, the truth of the conclusion. If the premises of a valid argument are true, the conclusion also has to be true. Yes? How do you know your assumptions are true? Aha! Uh -huh. Well, you got to prove them. I mean, to know that. Now, again, we're talking about, now this is just generally uh, the case in logic. And this isn't just an epistemological issue. This is what we really want out of a, uh, an argument is, uh, is both validity and the truth in the premises. Plato's got even stronger requirement for knowledge. To know something, for Plato, one, argument must be valid. Two, uh, assumptions must <coughs> be, what am I going to, what? Not just true, because it might have, we might have true opinions in our assumptions, right? It might be that we have true opinions in our assumptions, things that we don't really know, things that we were told by somebody else, things that we read in a book, things that we're just lucky about. We just happen to guess the right thing. So there might be lots of true premises from which we could derive true conclusions 
I mean, argument would be valid, but the conclusion wouldn't be knowledge, would it? I mean, because we derived it from measly true opinion. How can we know something if the basis for that knowledge is unreliable? So what am I going to, in order for something to be knowledge, according to Plato, it's not good enough that the, uh, the assumptions be merely true. That's good enough for the argument to be sound. What do they have to be? Huh? Proven? What's another word for that for Plato? Known. That is, I must be able to prove them. So if I didn't know anything, I must be able to prove it on the basis of assumptions that I already know, know, in other words, that I can prove. So this is a kind of an iterative process. Uh, put, uh, I'll just write it again here. In order to know this, I have to, in order to know three, I have to know one and two. But that means that each of one and two have to be things which themselves appear somewhere as the last line in a proof that I can construct. I, and uh, to put that in another way, I must be able to unpack three, if I'm to know it, from things I already know. And to know them, I have to be able to unpack them from things I already know. And those things have to be unpackable from things I already know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. No, no place can, for Plato, no place can uh, uh, empirical evidence, the evidence of the senses. It never gets to, I, this is all proof. This is all abstract, logical proof. And there's, I mean, in the end, this just goes back and back and back in time to before birth. I mean, there's just there's no time when something someone tells me or something I read in a book or something that I see or hear, there's no time for Plato when any of that can enter into this proof chain. It's, it's, it's got to be all proof. None of the, that, those other sources of information are good enough. That's why he says, that's why he says that if, if I know anything at all, it's got to be something that's been with me the whole time. And he says, it must be something that I brought with me into this life from a previous life. And what is it that the teacher does? The teacher doesn't give knowledge to anybody. All the teacher does is to show that, given things you already know, you can get to this new, you can get this new information out of it. And that's what he claims is going on. That's what Plato claims is going on in that discussion between Socrates and the slave boy. All that, the, all that Socrates is doing is calling the slave boy's attention to some of the implications of things he already knows. In other words, kind of like shining a light, saying, maybe you didn't notice, but if you put this bit of information that you know together with that bit of information that you know, you can pull out this conclusion. It's a maybe you didn't notice this. I mean, you've already got it inside of you. Now, what is it? What is it that unequivocally, I mean, I'm, I'm going to sort of embellish on Plato here a little bit, just to try and give you some reason to think that this isn't an altogether <coughs> dumb thing to say. What is it exactly that isn't given to you when you're learning something like a mathematical proof? I mean, you could. You could be given all the steps in the proof. And you can memorize those steps. That's often what we do at first. I mean, we sort of go over a proof. For example, like if it's a Pythagorean theorem, we go through all the steps. We try and get so that we could do it ourselves. If it's complicated enough, we might still not see it. And I want to put that, I want to put emphasis on that. We still don't get it. We still don't see it. 
And we can memorize the thing. We can get an A on a test in which we're asked, what's the, what's the proof of the Pythagorean theorem? We can, we can do perfectly well on such a test, but we might not yet see it. But then at some point, this, it don't have to take mathematical proofs as the only kinds of examples. At some point, though, you might be working through it and you say, whoa, of course, I see it. You know, like I get it now. Now I see why that has to be true. And all of a sudden, there's that flash, that aha experience. Now, that's something, at least, that comes from you. It's when things finally, you finally see them in the proper light. You finally see how different things fit together that you didn't quite see before, maybe. Call this something like logical insight. That's something, maybe, that's inborn, that can be called upon but which no one can really give you. Now, again, there might be philosophical arguments about that. But I think that's the kind of thing that Plato's got his, got his, uh, his, his claws on. I and mean, I think he's got, he sees that there's something there, something there that, that, or at least he thinks, there's something there that can't come, can't come from experience, must be there the whole time. And his take on all of this is that, um, is that it must mean that, uh, that we, we learned this or got this somehow in a previous life. And so it's, it's an epistemological argument, interestingly, an epistemological argument for the preexistence of the soul. Not a religious argument, but an argument based on a theory of knowledge. And, this, and, and Plato's theory of knowledge leads him to the conclusion that we must have existed before this life because it's the only place it's the only way to explain the fact that we have this logical insight that could be called upon. Now, before I'm going to, I saw some hands, but there's one more thing I wanted to mention. I think there's one, just one more thing. Yep. And that's this. I wanted to offer you a modern <coughs> theory that has some resemblance to this. Um, does the, no, the name Noam Chomsky ring a bell? It might not. Depends on what disciplines. Does anyone know in what field Noam Chomsky works? He's in linguistics. He's a he's a uh, extremely well-known linguistic theorist. I believe he's not. I don't know how recent it was, but I believe he's he's now retired from MIT. But he was uh, he was the head of a linguistics program that was one of the most important in the world for years and years, and it was important in large part because of him and his work. Uh, he believes. Uh, or believed, I can't, I haven't read him anything he's written re recently on the subject, but his, he's famous for thinking that uh, all language has a common deep structure. Uh, as different as the natural languages are, he says uh, all human languages share a common deep structure. So that uh, this deep structure is part of the human animal as the human animal uh, begins language learning. And then what we plug into this deep structure depends on where we are and who we're learning language from. But there, there's a common deep structure. And for the moment, I'd like you to not worry about the words deep structure so much, but think of it as something like a basic logic. So that there's a basic logic inherent in being a human being. Chomsky says of himself, or used to say of himself, uh, that he, like Plato, I don't know that he used Plato as his example, but he too believed that there was some knowledge that was innate, that is, inborn. It was knowledge of this deep structure of language. And of course, that's pretty damn important when you think of how important language is for the rest of our development, for all the rest of the ideas and beliefs and anything that we might call knowledge that we might have. Uh, language plays a rather central role in all of that. So he thought that, uh, that this, uh, this capacity we have for language uh, has a deep structure which we have to know uh, in order to, <coughs> to learn natural languages. Um, and of course, it, uh, again, it didn't lead, lead him to the conclusion that we had a prior life. I mean, his conclusion, suitably more modern, is just that this is part of our hard wiring. This is part of neurophysiology. This is part of the way we're built. Our brain is designed in a certain way, 
And implicit in that design is this knowledge of the deep structure or the, the basic logic of language. So that's, you might say that that's the kind of thesis that uh, Plato, 2,300 years ago or 2,400 years ago, whatever it is, that Plato was trying to advance. And of course, his conclusion, though, is that all knowledge is inborn and that that's evidence of the pre-existence of the soul. Back there. Um, Loud enough so that you can hear you in the front. So uh, Plato, <coughs> um, is what Plato's saying only related to um, like what can be learned? Is it related, excuse me, related to experiences as well? Not to, experience is not a source of knowledge for Plato. And remember, knowledge, he, you know, he, he think of him as he thinks of knowledge as something written in capital letters with exclamation points after it and underlines under it. I mean, knowledge is something very rare. Knowledge is something that it can be proven. We can't know things like uh, the capital of New York State. That's not the sort of thing that can be known. We can't know things like that. There's the, whether there's a hand in front of my face, my face right now or not. But those aren't things that can be known. Why? Because non-provable. You know, they can't be proven in particular from assumptions that themselves are known. I mean, I have to rely on vision <laughs> in order to draw the conclusion that there's a hand in front of my face. And vision is notoriously unreliable. It, uh, it's something we have to use. He doesn't say, forget about the evidence of the senses. He says, we've got to use this evidence uh, in our uh, daily lives. I mean, we're just forced to, but we shouldn't rely on it as a, uh, as a way of deriving knowledge. That is, there, there's a sense in which that's an important part of, uh, of what uh, uh, modern science teaches us as well. I mean, I'm just going to use this, we'll, we'll return to this later when we talk about Descartes. But uh, what we think we see may not be true. Uh, we think we see, I'll use this example later too, we think we see the sun moving across the sky during the day, but science tells us that's not exactly what's happening. It's an illusion. What's really happening, from at least some scientific perspectives, is that the Earth is rotating about its axis and, uh, axis and the sun is revealed at sunrise. It's not moving at all. Uh, complications in that story, too. But I mean, but here, I, I just want to use it right now as an example of some, some place where, like Plato, modern science suggests that we shouldn't rely overly on the senses, that the truth of the matter uh, may show us that the senses are uh, fooling us. Modern science doesn't say that we should never rely on senses. Modern science uh, says that there's an important role for experimentation and observation to play, but at least it shares this one insight with Plato and some of the other pre-Socratics -pre that what we think is true on the basis of the senses and basis of authorities uh, is not a reliable basis all by itself for scientific conclusions or for legitimate conclusions. Thank you.